Hello, and welcome to a conversation with Chris Martin and Jacqueline Renner. I am so excited to be hosting this today. Chris and Jackie are two of the most inspiring leaders I've had the honor of working with in my career, and this is just going to be a great conversation. So Chris, I'm excited to start with you. How do you describe your leadership style? Oh boy, um, it's evolved over time. Um, in the beginning, I had none, basically. I was never a born, never felt, you know, I was not a born leader. I was never like president of the senior class or anything like that. And then when I was offered the opportunity to be CEO, I was scared to death. And I went on Outward Bound. And that experience really helped me, gave me the confidence to, to, to feel that I could do this. And I, I learned that I had to listen really well. Jackie, same question to you. Well, you know, Chris, my uh, my experience is, is a bit more traditional than yours. I um, began to, my leadership journey when I was in school uh, through, the, through the traditional means of sports teams and fraternities and university, you know, associations, um, and then went through a pretty traditional corporate learning uh, path. I, my, my leadership style certainly has evolved as well as um, I've gotten more tenure. Uh, and I, I think what I like to do mostly in leading is to really empower people and, and get them full of passion and give them the tools to succeed. Because at the end of the day, we start our careers often with technical skills, but it's our ability to help other people lead that is the greatest, the greatest enjoyment, at least for me. I love that. And Jackie, what do you admire most about Chris as a leader? So uh -oh. Chris, <laughs> um, Chris has incredible passion, um, a real sense of continuity, and a real sense of care. I have never had the honor to work with a leader who so regularly talks about equality and all the stakeholders in the business. Um, yeah, so I think that's really, um, and I've learned a lot from Chris in that regard, too. Chris, same question for you. What do you admire most about Jackie? that she's comfortable having many people directly report to her. That honestly makes me uncomfortable. That's why I like this particular way the business is structured. And uh, I really appreciate that because I, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do it nearly as well as Jackie does. I mean, I could try and do it, but she does it with enthusiasm. I would do it just hanging on for bare life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've been hanging on for over 35 years and done a spectacular job. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back at those 35 years, what are some of your favorite moments? What really stands out to you? Well, the, you know, the one that's timely right now is going to a trade show. Looking, for, you know, in, in, when I go to bed at night, right now, I lay in bed thinking about the things that I would be planning to do starting this weekend when I would come out and, and get to see one of my best friends for a couple of days and then get to see all of my colleagues. So that's, you know, I've, I've gone to trade shows all over the world. There's very few left, but, and they get to travel. I got to travel all over the world. I've seen, I, I've, a friend of mine years ago who was our British distributor, I would go over once a year. He said, Chris, you've seen more of the United Kingdom than most of the residents of the United Kingdom. Wow, that's amazing. Jackie, what about for you, the last five years as the president? So I, I, would, I mirror Chris in, in seeing all our customers and our partners around the world. Um, and I'll never forget my first, uh, my first trip was to visit our Japanese distributor, our longest standing uh, business partner um, in the business. And I've really enjoyed going to our Navajo operations every year to see how they have grown and developed and how they really are part of the team. And, I think probably a third thing would be just about the nature of this industry and the business is that, you know, you're in manufacturing, you make something, it does something. Well, this, you know, the guitars and ukuleles, when they come together, they make an experience. And that's really what makes this industry just so fabulous is, is it's about the music, it's about the musicians, and it's about the passion, sharing, um, just sharing with each other. Yeah. yeah. Chris, what have been some of your biggest challenges over your tenure? A couple of times, things have, have gone south in manufacturing. And it, it's, it's often a slow roll 
it, it's not, you know, one day everything's fine and the next day there's a catastrophe. But at some point, I take a look at the situation. I go, this is bordering on catastrophic. And then to try and get everyone to realize that, hey, because we, we didn't notice it, you know, because it happened slowly. But instead of improving, we were, we were moving backwards for a variety of reasons. And then to try and stop it and then move forward again. That's, that's, those have been really challenging times for me. Jackie, what about you? This last year has been the whopper. And for, you know, for many years, everybody said, no, you really need to be a strategic leader. You know? And all of a sudden, the word crisis management popped up. Um, and so the ability for a very, um, we're a very traditional company in how we have operated and the, um, the, the, the imperative to really shift on a, on a dime and really learn to pivot quickly has been in the beginning of challenge, but it was also, and it has been an unbelievable uh, growth experience for people inside the company. New, new, new unexpected leaders have, have cropped up. Teamwork has been is done in new ways, both inside the company and with our, and with our business partners around the world. And so, you know, you make some lemonade when you're given lemons and, uh, but, but boy, COVID, the pandemic, it, it, you know, boom, that was it. I and I, I have to say something, you know, I remember Jackie, before you joined us, periodically, someone would say, can I work from home? And we would scratch our head and go, boy, I don't know. I don't know if we can, how would we accommodate that? How would we let some one person work from home when everybody else is in the office? And so we never really addressed it. We were like, nope, no, you can't work from home. Now, all of a sudden, we're talking about developing a hybrid work model. What an interesting change. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jackie, speaking of changes, you were the first female president in the history of this company. I'm um, honored to have gotten to work with you. What um, advice do you have for other women who are trying to reach positions of leadership? Well, don't be afraid to be the first, first of all. Just actually don't be afraid. Um, you will learn if you're committed to learning and you'll grow if you're committed to growing. Um, go from your strengths and, and lead from your heart and your head. And, you know, hopefully you have the opportunity to work with uh, a partner like Chris, who will also help guide you for, to the success of the, of the particular organization that you have been um, invited to lead. That's right. Chris, now you hired Jackie, the first female yeah. president. Yeah. What was your motivation in that? Was it setting a... Um, a precedence for your daughter who might one day take over the company? I guess in hindsight, but primarily Jackie was the best candidate, you know? And, and so that, that, that's what I saw. And yes, it's probably helped me to be honest. And I was raised by my mother. My mother had three kids. She was divorced twice. Um, I married a judge. I've, you know, I'm comfortable around strong women. I appreciate what they bring to a situation. And, and it's just, it's just Jackie was the right candidate. I love that. Now, Chris, social and environmental stewardship have really been a core of your leadership and the direction you've taken, Martin. And what, um, what made that so important for you? Why is that an issue that you're passionate about? You know, when I, I look back and I, I would see times when the company would use a material and then for whatever reason, couldn't. And let's, you know, let's be honest, we used to use real tortoise shell. We used to use elephant ivory. Well, all of a sudden you couldn't get it. And fortunately we were able, and this is a while ago to find a synthetic alternative to tortoise shell. I, and in fact, when I do the little thing we're gonna do next Thursday live, I'm gonna put a call out. Someone somewhere has to have the ability to come up with synthetic ivory, but anyway, so, and then, you know, I, as I was getting involved in the business and getting involved in the, in the, the, the procurement side and, and paying attention to that and hearing about the challenges and, and the, the way things are getting regulated and, and it's, it's just getting more difficult to get these things that we took for granted, I realized this is not going away. <laughs> this is not gonna get better unless we talk about making it better because we took it for granted. There'll always be trees. 
there'll always be big old trees. No, <laughs> when's the best time to plant a tree? 50 years ago or today. And so it was too late. Like, you know, I should have done it 50 years ago, but I'm committed to doing it today. That's great. Jackie, how have you um, worked on environmental um, programs with the company? Uh, implemented waste reduction programs. We put a chiller plant in, which reduced our um, energy footprint 40% in the Nazareth facility. We also seek to mimic all that stuff in Navajoa so that we are as environmentally um, forward as possible. Um, and we have you know, programs that we're putting in place for the long term for the company, um, not only around the sustainability of wood and re that reforestation, but for everything that we do inside the business. It's, a, you know, it, it's like lean, you know, the lean Six Sigma initiatives. It's a journey where every small step can make a big impact if it's consistent and done for the long term. Well, I want to talk about the factory. I have had the opportunity to visit the factory many times, and I am always so touched by seeing the craftspeople, the, the, the luthiers, how many people it takes touching every guitar and the multi-generations that go into making every instrument. I actually find it a really emotional experience and really uplifting. And I wonder what the two of you feel when you um, walk the floors of the factory. So I'll go, because I think I've, I may have done it a couple more times than you, Jackie, just because of longevity. You know, what, what I, and it goes back to when I had a chance to spend a little time in the factory working. Um, I followed a guitar through one summer and then a summer or two later, I actually worked in the shop. And uh, what I came away from that experience was, first of all, I'm kind of klutzy when it comes to woodworking, but I'm surrounded by people that are really, really good at it. And that, Kate, that's one of the reasons when, when we can, that we give tours. Because I, I want people, I not only want the customer to see how their guitar is being made, but I want my coworkers to, to have the opportunity to, to show off in front of the customer because they're really good at what they do. Jackie, same question to you. What do you feel when you're walking the floor at the factory? Well, I, I you know, it's, yeah, we're, we're, yes, we're making guitars and we're making ukuleles, but it's people making them. Um, with pride and what Chris said, with, with incredible skill, and also with a whole bunch of really advanced um, manufacturing talent that helps continue to make the instruments better and better every year. So for me, there's, there's this sort of there's the smell of the wood, um, in the, and I love watching the, the pearl work being done. And it's for me, it's a blend of all of that that makes the factory very special. And because our headquarters are where the factory, the main factory is, there's a sense of camaraderie. Often that doesn't happen. A factory is, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles away from where you are, and you swoop in and you see it once or twice a year. We all live together, right? We're all in the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania. We see each other in Home Depot and the grocery store. And so it's part of a community. And I think, again, that, that Kate, that's probably what you experience when you, when you come in, because you are part of the family. Yeah, that's funny. You, you just answered my next question, which is what, what makes Martin so special? Chris, do, do you want to add to what makes Martin so special? Well, if, 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 you know, a lot of companies do organizational charts, right? I've always like, joked with my colleagues in HR. I said, we should do an organization, organizational chart that basically shows the familial relationships between all of our coworkers. Yeah. Kate, did you know that I am tangentially related to my valued assistant, Mary Groller? And yeah. neither of us knew that until Mary was at a family function and someone said, do you work with Chris? And, the, and they started putting the pieces together and it's like, well, I'm Chris's cousin. Well, I'm so-and-so's cousin. And they, they met in the middle. <laughs> We'll have to create a two degrees of separation of Chris yeah, Martin contest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Jackie, so you're preparing to retire. This is a big time of transition in the company. Um, how are you um, preparing the company for your retirement, uh, working on the transition plans? My role in the transition is to really make sure that the organization is in the best shape that it can be. 
and that there's a platform for the new CEO president to continue to let, you know, help Martin thrive and grow into the future. That, I mean, that's the, the biggest things that we have to do in a transition. I'm committed, and Chris knows this, to do everything I can to make sure that the new person coming on board gets the support, gets the backstory, understands um, if they're not from the industry, like I was not from the industry, you know, here are people that you should get to know quickly. Um, so we're, we're working it hard. We've got a plan. We all know that plans are only as good as the paper they're written on and they change based on reality. So a lot of it'll depend on the, 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 the final candidate that comes on board, but we'll do our best to make sure that it is a smooth transition and that the whole industry gets to know that new person very quickly. And Chris, how, were, how will your role change as you transition from CEO and chairman to executive chairman of the board? So I'll, I'll tell a, a funny story to, to kind of put into perspective what I hope, even though I'm not selling the business. I, got, I knew Henry Steinway. Henry and I served on the NAM Museum Board when the NAM Museum was just an idea. So we were there when the idea became a reality. And I got to hang out with Henry. And Henry was a great storyteller. And the one story I loved for him to tell was when he said, yes, it got to the point where my brother and I realized that none of our children wanted to join the family business. So it was appropriate to sell it. He said it was very emotional. But we realized it for the business, it was the best thing to do. And we sold it to a bunch of folks that really didn't know what they bought and they didn't do a very good job with it. And so it got sold again. And the second buyers approached Henry and they said, Mr. Steinway, would you do us a favor? Yes, what do you need? Now we'll compensate you. Oh, that's fine. Would you come to the trade show and just stand in our booth? I'll be in the booth at the next trade show and the one after that and the one after that. I hope to travel again more and do that thing, which I love to do. We go into a music store and tell the Martin story. You know, when I, when I show up somewhere, it's like, well, I remember, where was I in the, oh my gosh, Taiwan, Singapore, somewhere. And the dealer in the store said, let's go. I want you to go meet my competitor, which was, he was down the block. So we go down the block. And I walk in and there was a customer there and the competitors knew each other. And they said, hi, the customer looks at me and he's just like, oh my God, oh my God, it's, it's, it's him, it's, it's Mr. Martin, oh my God. <laughs> How cool is that? Well, Chris, I've experienced that many times with you on the NAM floor. <laughs> Yep. I've even had to wrangle people and get them in line as, because they want to want you to autograph their guitars. So yep. you are a rock star. So Jackie, um, any special plans for your, for your retirement? Well, you know, since this transition we planned way before the pandemic came, came into play, I had some different plans of what I was going to do this fall. I don't know if I'll be able to do them because they, they include some uh, initially some pretty significant uh, travel, both to visit with um, friends and colleagues in Europe, um, as well as to go out West for a while. So we'll see how that plays out. And again, flexibility and adaptability. Longer term, I intend to remain really engaged in the causes that are important to me around um, international understanding and arts and culture and um, the safety and security of our youth. Um, and probably, uh, if uh, you know, ha if I have the opportunity to uh, also serve um, in, a, in a board capacity for um, family-owned companies, privately-owned companies, um, to help govern and guide them as well. So I think that'll fill my plate. <laughs> so Chris, what are your special plans for the future of Martin? Huh. You know, I, I as much as I've felt that we've been extremely successful. I have a feeling there's more opportunity out there for us. I'm just not sure right now what it is, but having seen where we came from to where we are today, I can't imagine the future, but I know it's a future that's going to be interesting and hopefully rewarding to my family's business and my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Now, this is also the year when you're completing your chairperson of 
NAM. Yeah. Um, you spoke it many times about how NAM is, it's so important to be involved with NAM as yes. a yes. MI professional. I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that and talk about some of the initiatives that you completed while you were the chairman that you're proud of. So it's, a, it's been an eight year gig. I started as secretary, then I was treasurer, which is pretty funny because that's really not my forte. Uh, but it did give me a look under the hood of NAM, you know, from a from financial perspective. And then I was vice chairman. And normally, like the vice president of the U.S., when you're vice chairman, you just wait till you're chairman. But in this case, NAM decided right around the time that I was going to be vice chairman to split NAM and the NAM Foundation. And the NAM Foundation chairman is the vice chairman of NAM. So I got to be the first chairman of the NAM Foundation. That was pretty cool. Now, the whole idea was when you're chairman, not only are you an ambassador for NAM at the NAM shows, you travel the world with, world with Joe Lamont doing that ambassadoral stuff, thanking our partners in Japan, for example, attending the Shanghai trade show. I didn't get to do any of those. Fortunately, again, as I said earlier, I've seen parts of the world that other NAM chairmen haven't. So I've been fortunate in that respect. What What's most interesting is this thing that we were not forced to do, but re when, when Joe realized that the possibility of this Windsor NAM show not happening was real, he said, well, we could sit it out or we could do something different. And all of us on XCOM encouraged him to consider doing something different. And we've been supporting that effort. And it's been, okay, when you think about the fact that, you know, for how many years, the focus of this association for the six months coming up to this show is to create this physical trade show and then to pivot away from that and take those human resources and the skills they have and say, instead of doing the thing you know how to do, we want you to do something like it in a digital space. And this thing that we created, this Believe in Music and, and all the software, that so much of that is going to be durable that this thing we're doing next week that digital part of it on the internet we're going to do that again next year this is not a once and done next year we're going to have a real show and we're going to have a digital a, a robust digital bolt-on and that that to me is the most exciting thing that you know not being the traditional nam chairman allows me to appreciate what's happening right now in nam yeah, and to be able to take what happens at NAM and really expand that to everyone in the world. How about it's a great it? opportunity for the industry. Right. Years ago, Joe was going to interview me on one of the breakfasts, right? So I'm in the green room and we're chatting. And he says, Chris, any anything you want to tell me before we go out there? I said, Yeah, Joe, you know, I'm going to bring up that thing I talk to you about every time I see you about making this a public show. And he goes, Oh, Chris. We don't want to talk about that at the breakfast. That's a complicated question. Can we save that for later? Kate, here we are. We saved it for later. <laughs> Perfect. Jackie, how have uh, you been involved with NAM and what are some of the initiatives you've enjoyed working on? Well, I, I think the one that comes uh, closest to my, to my heart is the Smart Women in Music um, initiative that was started. and. Um, so it, 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 has, it has grown in having uh, executed its first leadership institute. And one of our colleagues at, at, uh, at Martin, Kit Culpepper, was um, chosen to participate. It was a great growth experience for her. So to have um, an affinity uh, organization within NAM that really will help other women grow into leadership positions in the industry, I think is, is really, really great. So I just would encourage the women that are part of NAM to reach out and, and to seek participation um, in it and to seek other women in the industry. Um, so you can, you know, get together and have a cup of coffee or have a, when we're back, when you're back, they're all back at the real NAM to have some other beverage in the evening together <laughs> and get to know each other. I love that. Well, I have one final fun question for both of you. Um, in all of your time with Martin, what's been the favorite guitar you've created or been a part of? You know, Kate, I, 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 I'm fortunate that I, I get to pick my own wood. <laughs> and so I, I just, just, just because not only are they at 
a beautiful work of art that functions, but I just love fancy pearl inlaid Martin guitars. I just, I think that's the, that's the high, that's our highest offering right there. It's like, this is it. And, and people, people are like, you know, Chris, why don't you use perfect wood on every guitar? There's just not enough perfect wood, whatever that means, you know? All wood has character, some has more character. Oddly enough, if the wood has a little character, people don't like it. If it has a lot of character, they love it. And I say to people, they're like, Chris, I want, I want perfect wood. I go, oh, we got it. It's called a D45. Jackie, what about you? I think, it, and it may be behind you, Kate, on your screen, probably, if that's the SC-13. Yes. Um, I think that one instrument in, you know, in, in that it started from some fundamental R&D and, and external research, and it came to fruition, and that it was, that it's so well accepted, um, and it creates a new platform for the future for the company. I think I'm really excited about that, but I have to agree with Chris as well that the, the, the intricate work that's, that is done, especially in our custom shop, it just awes me. So every time I've seen, um, you know, Tim Teal, who's, one of our, our uh, chief instrument designers come up with an arts and crafts series, small body custom that they're just, and I, I, I have a, a, a real bias to this, to the small body instruments. I just want to hug it. And um, so that I would say that, so that the uh, arts and crafts series and custom in the custom shop is also something that I really have enjoyed um, seeing the development of. Okay, oh, Kate, I have to tell us in hindsight, a funny story about the SC-13. You know, it was so new. And, it, and it, 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 it was an idea, and then it was like fits and starts. And how's it going? Oh, it's tough, particularly that whole, you know, contraction where the neck and the body meet, because that's new. This thing, you know, you can adjust this thing. It's not permanently fixed. And, you know, I know one of the job of a leader like Jackie and I is once you commit to something, you're committed, you support it. Because if a leader wavers, then people go, ah, Maybe it's not that important. So the, the funniest, and I think Jackie, you'll in hindsight agree, wasn't that funny at the time, was when you said, okay, Chris, we're going. We're gonna get this thing done in a year and a half. And I went home at night, I felt boy, this is modern technology. Modern technology doesn't wait. And I came in the next morning and I said, Jackie, can we talk? Yeah, about what? About that year and a half thing. What about it? Can we do it in a year? And we did. And Jackie, imagine if we hadn't done it, we would not have been able to introduce it at a trade show because we didn't have the summer trade show. <laughs> in, in, in retrospect, Chris, you are so you right. <laughs> Speaking of Believe in Music Week, what about those of us in, in the association and the, the passionate people that the association serves, the musicians and the, the people that support musicians when they go on the road, they're struggling. Guitar business is good, but the touring business is not. The live sound business is not good. And so this Believe in Music Week event is partly a trade show. It's partly a networking opportunity. And it's partly an opportunity for those of us that are fortunate to give something back. And I've made a $100,000 donation personally on behalf of Diane and me to the NAM Foundation to jumpstart this week of giving. And I'm hoping that everyone will consider giving something to those of us that are part of this community that are struggling right now. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jackie, for your time. Yeah, this is fun. This is a wonderful week. Thank you, Kate. All right. See ya. Bye. Bye.